Hello. Ooh, good afternoon. So Sam Fox is back from the airport, and uh, he says, he decided, that the open mic was going to be at Benedict tonight, and a sign-up sheet exists. I have seen it. It will be at the inn at dinner. Uh, and that's the last one. That's the last open mic. We've got a couple of other activities planned for Thursday and Friday that we'll tell you about tomorrow, and then uh, the second dance on Saturday. Um, we are um, going to be hitting you up the last few days of the conference uh, for, um, what's the polite word, gratuities for the, uh, the food service people over at the inn who have been providing our meals for us and, and taking your plate away. Um, that wonderful service that is so disorienting when I get home and I finish dinner and I'm like, well, <laughs> right? Um, so if you uh, would like to contribute uh, toward giving those people um, a show of our appreciation, find one of us staff members and, and we'll, we'll take that from you and, and um, add it to the pot uh, for the Aramark folks. It's a good day for Southern Accents today. We had Jill McCorkle's craft lecture this afternoon. This evening we've got Tony Early and right now we got Morris Manning. Thank you, folks. Um, I want to express my gratitude to Wyatt for asking me to be here and giving me the opportunity to meet so many wonderful people. It's, a, it's a, quite a special place. I'm going to read uh, from uh, a book that's coming out next spring called The Gone and the Going Away. We'll see how much time we have and then I'll read some newer, newer poems. <clears throat> the Complaint Against Roni Laswell's Rooster. Attention, Mr. Roni Laswell. Roni, short for Tyrone, I hear. The hour your rooster blows, four is too, too early. Another two would do. Go, speak to your rooster, Roni. The Slate. Way back, the men had funny names like Tiny, who was anything but small. And Tiny's son was called Tiny Two, or Double T. And Tiny's wife, who was big and mean, was known as Honey. And everybody called Honey's sister Bertie. And Bertie, who couldn't talk, much less whistle, was beautiful but touched in the head. So Bertie lived with them way down in Fogtown Holler beside the green waters of Shoestring Branch, and only the land was rightly named, for it was foggy half the day down there, and the branch was skinny and whipped across the mossy roots and rocks like a snake. But by the time I came along, Tiny and Honey were already planted, and Bertie was bent over and old, and Tiny, too, was getting on and sleeping in the chicken coop with 14 chickens and a rooster named Mr. Sump, and Sump was short for something. And Tiny, too, just said he liked the company. And besides, he had to guard the chickens against red-legged Johnny, who was a fox, because Mr. Sump was only good at making chickens. And Tiny, too, would have winked about that sort of thing. And all of this, I learned it young, when I was just a scratch of a boy. And I skipped down shoestring branch to Fogtown Holler and found old Tiny, too, who told me where I was from and who my people were and how they named the world around them. The very notion of God as a clean stone peach. Beyond your heaven rasping fuzz, say what else you are. Unsectioned pulp, sweet Galling juice, no root, no sleepy branch. About your inmost place, who pinched its old hillbilly face? I'm going to. I've had a hard time trying to figure out how to time this, so I'm skipping one that's 
long and cumbersome. This is called the debt. My father rode a horse to school. He was a scholar for a time at Tyner, Kentucky, seat of wisdom and learning in those parts, where he hung his letters rightwise on the line and summed or took away his numbers by the heat of a coal stove and the beam of window light flushed in from the yard where his horse stood tied to a rail. One room was where this happened in the Big Depression, when nothing else was happening except some shucky beans and chickens, a midnight possum snare, and now and then a coal field murder, and ponies going blind from the dust and the dark time down in the mines. And he had to get his memories right, which meant poetry by heart, by tap and rhyme, old-fashioned heart-sick stuff like Annabelle Lee by Poe, easy to remember and recite, a woman the lover loved gone dead but still alive in memory risen to song. It was familiar ground for a boy whose ground was made of blood, blood of vengeance, blood of the lamb, blood kin, blood-soaked land. Familiar ground and dull, therefore, which is why my father decided he'd pull a funny one on that old Poe, and so he dug up another woman less elegant than Annabelle Lee, less ravishing and downright forward. And he remembered a verse for me. "'Twas Friday night, about a week ago, I went up to my room, and square in my chair, a combing her hair, sat a gal named Eula Loom. Her teeth stuck out, but the rest of her no, for Eula was straight as the stick of a broom. What other 12-year-old could have had such vision except my father? And yet, how many times before that age did I see him blind with rage and grief and hear him sing until his voice was there alone, remembering the room, the verse. I wasn't scared by any of that or hurt. He loved me. He gave me something to see and something to listen to, a music box with a horse inside and a man with a pistol running a woman around a tree to a raspy fiddle tune, winged and bucked and slowing down. It happens that I learned poetry myself in a one-room schoolhouse, converted to a kind of house, wood stove and water pump, where I lived alone and glad with a dog named Banjo Jack for company on the ridges and by the bottom stream. We both liked wandering, but if he got too far, I'd holler out, Hey, Banjo Jack, Banjo Jim, come on back from where you've been. Is it silly to holler out a rhyme for no one but a dog in the hillsides? Perhaps, but that's the way it happened. At night, I'd listen to the wind and read from Keats or later Warren my kinsman in a way, a fellow Kentuckian darker than me who suffered and loved this place. And so I suffer and love it still and drag my father with me knowing it came from him, from being here, the boy, the horse, the memory in the heart, the sail away lady, sail away tune, a skinny woman skipping away. There's a number of really short poems in this manuscript. They're 30 words long, six lines each, five words to the line. Um, odd numbered lines are iambic in character, even numbered lines are trochaic. Weird little puzzle um, that a friend of mine calls honky tonkas. <laughs> The Song of Roni Laswell. I hear you, Roni Laswell, way up yonder. Oh, where's a curly gal to love? Ballads bring a feller low. Like you alone up there, 
rounding with the moon above. The last poem gone, a swaller in the kettle. Well, I was sitting there drinking pot liquor left from a mess of beans. Something come over me. Sakes, no, not hardly his presence, but God Almighty, he was close. This is longer and more dramatic. In Kentucky, um, sometimes a nickname for coal is black gold. So the, there will be a reference here to a, a boat named the Black Gold Bell. The Great Kentucky River Steamboat Dream. This is an adventure recounted with the barest embellishment in which my compadre, the parson, and yours truly did find ourselves tootling down the Kentucky River fast aboard the worst pretension of a steamboat ever to roil those hallowed waters. What's more, I dreamed the whole thing up, which accounts for why this tale begins in medias race, as it were, without the encumbrance of a preceding bang. Suddenly, we were on the river, where the gloomy skulls of garfish hitched with fishing lines swung from the branches of the overhanging trees. The wheel astern, the black gold bell, our matronly vessel, was powered by a moonshine still, which spewed and bucked and caused said wheel to drag and bounce with such calamity, we surmised we'd fare far better if we let our handsome lady float, which we did, permitting us to redeploy the still and slake our hard-won thirst. Oh, we were a crafty crew, and soon we were compelled to sit and admire the splendor of our environs. They were splendid. Buzzard soaring cliffs above the tender tree-held whir of bugs, the washed out hairy roots of trees still clinging to the banks, the river muddy in the bends but clear and green over the shoals. A farmer's cheerful scarecrow wore a skirt and had a painted gourd for a head. No pleasure dome, alas, but half again as wondrous. Yet our reverie, I'm sad to say, did not last long because the river, rather inexplicably, ran out of water. And we found ourselves washed up in front of a sign that read, Welcome to Tomcatville, Pop 2. So we disembarked, tramping down a path that led to a village of sorts comprised of a rambling general store called Pappy's, which the aforesaid parson and myself did enter. A cross-cut saw festooned a wall and coffee mill was mounted to a post and the floor gave back a bounce when stepped upon. In the back of the room at a cook stove stood a giant of a grinning man with shirt-sleeved arms and an eye patch. Where y'all keep the women at? The parson called, recalling the twitch of innuendo suggested by the name of this quaint whistle stop. I run them off! The big man boomed, his voice resounding as if he'd stuck his head inside a barrel. Besides, this here's a rough old place for a woman. We're pert near parched for delicacy. I got a bolt of calico and maybe a ribbon or two, he mused, but that ain't hardly nothing, not for a woman who fancies the finer things. You must be pappy, I prodded. Zooks the very same, he growled. I keep this place and cook the grub. Kind sir, did you say grub? The parson inquired and clutched his hands hopefully together. At this, our patron grinned. I got two portions left. Of what, I asked. Of Pappy's Tomcat Special. It's all I ever make and all, I'll, and all you'll ever get. No pickled eggs, I ventured. Fresh out, he roared and whirled around to stir upon the stove a piping antiquated kettle that listed a few degrees to the left. It was a low foreboding scene. We'll take the Tomcat Special, sir. The parson seethed, accepting, so to speak, 
the glove this man had thrown. I reckon you will, Pappy chuckled, his sole eyes squirrely with delight. At that he fetched two dinner plates and forked what looked to be the tongue of a boot from the mire inside the kettle. Mmm, mmm, he grunted and ladled up what passed for gravy in Tomcatville and oozed it over the woeful slab of whatever it was that lay on the plate and appeared to curl when the gravy hit it. Our host repeated this technique for the other plate and set them both upon the counter. Just hold it, boys, he hissed and flipped his eye patch up. And there, in the dark of the dead socket, sat a little bitty possum, reared back on his haunches, who reached a tiny hand into his pouch and retrieved a gob of hoary froth and flung it down in equal portions on the platters of God knows what in the world it was. That there's a special part, yelled Pappy, and winked his other teary eye and with that, he leapt into the air and slapped his two bare feet together. Therewith, our spectacle is resolved. But we learned that day a couple of things about this world. For instance, why the population of Tomcatville, Kentucky is rightly two. And we'd met a man so starved for entertainment, he'd stuffed a possum in his head and cooked his shoes. His other eye, I said, was teary, and it was. A stream ran down the old man's cheek. That fellow, Pappy, he had a hurt in him. Untelling how or why, but he'd cried himself inside my dream, which is where we left him, the parson and I, with his possum friend in their river town, at the end of the river where the river runs out. The man who ate the collard greens. And danged if I didn't eat the hell out of some collards. I even hollered, here I big woman. <laughs> no telling what all I cooked up next. I was so happy. <laughs> okay, that's that batch. And... Um, these are different kinds of poems, some tall tale-ish, but a lot more meditative, I, I think. And this manuscript doesn't have a title yet. Birds arriving in dim light. Three of them line a branch as bare as a bone, and pairs and ones arrive, and soon the old tree flutters again with living leaves as if it has remembered how to be a tree, as if it has come back. The birds are reddish gray in the light which is dimming down and a mist of fog is coming up the hollow and soon the top of the tree will disappear and faintly rustle and return for the night and longer to its dream. A man like Sam Dude Medlock dead for God knows how long now, would have pointed up the tree and said, they's decoration, honey, and cast an approving nod and an oath that even an unwashed heathen like himself could see the Lord was a wonder maker, and it was the stiff-necked Baptists, honey, who saw the world as plain. Sam Dude called me honey, and he had riddles and saws to impart, such as a stubble field would tell a lie if the truth was a better story, or one I've repeated for amusement, never trust a Pemberton honey, which I've decided must be wise. He always said it gravely, as if he was sorry for the Pembertons, sorry some people can't be trusted. But the thing Sam Dude did was play the banjo, though the name he gave for his instrument was Banger, 
A word like that was decoration to my ears. Sam Dude would play his banjo and say, let's take it now around the world, and now let's go another round. And then he'd sing. They was two old gals laying in the sand, each one wishing the other was a man. <laughs> and that was decoration too. When he had run through all the words, he'd go around the world again, and then he'd say, let's get back home. And his fingers would scratch the banjo's head. I heard Sam Dude was born a mile or two outside of Soaptown, which was somewhere over that away. But Soaptown disappeared once soap and everything went store bought. It's all a piece of a dream back then. And Sam Dude, too. He's gone around the world, but he comes back in a way. And I remember him, and he leaves a riddle in my mind. He was a wonder maker too. The birds are wax wings passing through. They come in spring and again in the fall. They arrive in threes and pairs and ones to line the naked branches and call the old tree back from its dream. I think I've also been interested in working on these new poems in the, um, I think some, one of the craft talks mentioned the importance of symbolic language. And uh, I've been thinking a lot about the relationship between something that is actual and something that is also symbolic at the same time. Symbolism. After being empty and seeming to be disappeared in time, how soon when periodic streams fill up they follow down the wooded hill and obey the originating form of the land. It is like watching a dream come back and by remembering the dream, the dream is seen to increase. It makes more symbols now and more details have risen up and the cause for all of it remains as it must in any lulling dream unknown. I could say the dream has come alive with a clarity that makes me think it never was a dream at all. Once the streams are rushing down with the sound of a slurry voice and the slap of water slopping from rock to rock and over muted moss and vines, I easily believe Within this hill could be one imagination, and the little streams come forth at will. Or because a spirit in the mind imagines with a kind of hope, all things could be continuous, and here is momentary proof, though proof that will appear to recede. Because the content is what changes, and overnight the streams will go, becoming glosses of what they were today, and then a wrinkle, a line of worry or some decision plotted in the ground and solemnly thought down the hill to the slick hump of the bank before the annihilating plunge, and soon there will be none at all. But the form will stay, and deeper still in time, though lost with every rain. Always this is a wonder to me, with the sense of something lonely making its one companion and counterpart. What God imagined could be done with all of this is everything. When I um, graduated from college, I went back home and there were no jobs. So I uh, continued doing what I had done in college, loading uh, trucks to deliver groceries to country grocery stores. This is a, a <clears throat> so 
somewhat based on that experience. The glass eye. Freddie Terry would take it out and blow on it like an ember to fog it over and then he'd polish it slowly on his shirt tail before setting it back in the little cave above his cheek where it peered out shinier now and bluer than the good one. And when it caught the light, it flickered as if it were coming to life. He lived with two or three brothers in a railroad rooming house. I've seen them dancing on the porch, unbelievable as ghosts, barefoot in overalls, and one of them would plink and pluck a banjo, foregoing melody for the more mysterious sense of sound. That house is years away in time. It was said the brothers shared a wife. At the end, they lived in public housing without a porch and kept indoors. But all of them are gone from the earth. There was no skill in the work we did. The work, at least, didn't ask it. Clattering down through the warehouse with iron-wheeled ancient carts to drag them loaded back to the dock where the only 20th century fact, a straight box truck, waited for loading. We'd do it again and again until all seven trucks were gone to the country stores, which now themselves are gone. Bottoms, Pottsville, Jennings, Sinkhorns, Red Top, even the little towns have gone. But some of the men gave skill to the work simply by enjoying it, the rhythm and repetition, and then they'd interrupt it. Freddie would take it out around midday and squint with his good one through the glass and say, let's see if I see dinner time. <laughs> and then in the afternoon, he'd fish it out again and say, I believe I see it, five o'clock, holding the eye before him like a lantern as though he were leading us from darkness. A portion of the cosmos in Kentucky. It has, though not symbolically, but starkly, a star. And then the view of the star and the vague illumination below of a hill shaggy with trees and then serenely, as if it appeared from nothing, the visible form of one tree to suggest the many, and a bird like a shadow tied to a shape sprung from the slightly swaying end of a branch to send its presence silently into this early gesture of time and abstraction as a way to say it all exists in this slow gap of the night whose revolution is but an arc. Not even half a circle is made because of the hills which ring like stories or the resonant voice of someone telling a story and how that voice is making up the moment, though calling it a moment while not wrong is still a mere description. But isn't that enough? To walk into the knowledge of this system, to see how plainly it starts, and then to have that thought refused or changed, and then to see the point in the mind, so strange and immediately there, it isn't even beautiful yet. Everybody staying awake? <laughs> Bluebird egg. <clears throat> when life was least inside it, something whose expertise was native to, incapable of plot, came by to suck 
the baby's yellow ink and gently turn the nicked end of the shell away, so placing it like a prop in the green scene below the skirt of the peach tree, whose fruit this year came just to blossom before a late arriving killing frost. As a work of art, the shell is perfect in form and perfectly deep in blue, but there is nothing in it now, and nothing in it now for art. God allows this snuffing out, and still I let him be my darling. It isn't always easy, you God, who made the birds and trees and death. This is called The Foster Boy. There was a legend when I was in school that one night Ralph Boyd and Ricky Foster's brother, whose name I can't remember, got drunk and upon some challenge or other, jumped or climbed into the open door of an empty freight car, intending only to ride it for a mile to prove courage or some defiance. But the train had picked up too much speed and in fear and perhaps from drinking more, they fell asleep until the train slowed down again. But by this time they had arrived in Tennessee. The night had passed completely by and they had gone farther from home than either one had ever been. And now they'd stopped in a switching yard where a mountain of coal was heaped up like an impenetrable mind before them, a sense of fatalism and fate in an unknown town in Tennessee. Everything except the mound of coal looked out of place and strange, and the town was full of strangers not to be trusted or looked at face to face, but anyone with eyes could see Ralph Boyd was a half-wit, how he stooped, how he seemed made up by God on a day when God decided the point of loving even the least of these had needed to be proved again. That love shall reach beyond all reason, beyond return and understanding. How quietly that strain of love goes out, knowing it must go far, like a dream to the point of being lost. Ralph Boyd and the foster boy, who was a sage compared to Ralph, had, uh, had gone unwittingly that far to the end of love's oblivion where even the familiar, the shroud of fog slowly lifting off the mound of coal, is unknown. And to say, this is the reach of love, is senseless. By now, the boys were sick with hunger and wandering into a country store, the foster boy persuaded Ralph to trade his shoes for a loaf of bread. They split the loaf and returned to the maze of rail lines and the mound of coal. The foster boy told Ralph to pick a line and walk, and he would take another. I've wondered about that choice, how it must have seemed intelligent under the white spring sky and green of Tennessee. And then I've wondered in silence without end how far he went, the foster boy. A few days later, Ralph Boyd on blackened blistered feet returned with the heel from his half of the loaf remaining in the bundle he'd made by tearing a sleeve from his shirt and tying a string he'd found around one end. And an unbelievable story to tell, though he didn't know the end of it. Remembering I know why I went to school, to learn the legends, how a boy could wander down the line going to doom or transformation and make a story of himself for love, for sad, exceeding love.
I'll read two more. <clears throat> the woodcock, which is a beautiful uh, woodland bird. Good morning, all you finches. If not elated by the wind swaying the dry stalks where you can't perch, yet merely cling and swagger, then I've fallen shorter than I think of true elation. You look happy with God's happiness to me, and that blots out a bleak sometimes I have prevailing. You have more of charity than all of us, though how we've needed it, and need it bluntly now, a shock of regard, like a loaf of hard bread thrown from heaven, we need to get hit. And good night, you owls, and even you, old woodcock, buried in the brown but springing ground of the woods, all night I heard you chiding, take that, you called a hundred times, and that, it is well I never see you or the love beyond our love in your eye. It would turn me away in tears to know your hammer reporting from the black and echoing is all for me. For being in one motion awake and restless with the revelation that answered is a prayer either I forgot I made or didn't make. Actually, I'm sorry, I miscounted. There's a little town in Kentucky called Bimble. B-I-M-B-L-E. This is called Going Back to Bimble. If I went, I'd go through Shepherd Town and Burning Springs. I'd cross the stream some people still call Hogskin Branch and pass through Treadway just before the Pinhook Chapel where I heard the preacher pulled a pistol and shot the bell after the rope broke then called a special collection for another rope and took in twice the tithes of the last two months and said, hell fire, he ought to shoot that bell more often. And then, in a mile or so, I go through bright shade and follow bad Jack Branch, so called for a stubborn ancestor when he ran rowdy through these parts, till it crosses Collins Fork and then in no time I'd be at Blue Hole, and that's about halfway to Bimble. I'd say I'd follow on the fork, since it's the best stretch of country God spread out anywhere, and go on up to Cotton Gin to see if anyone still resides in what they called the Big Rock House, a marvel of design for its day, then circle back through Bonnie Glade, Bee Gum, and Timber Tree, then at last I'd come through Mop and Gap, and down below I'd see it, Bimble the little string of houses strung along the red bird bottom where Mrs. Johnsy Ponder lived, who people said knew everything. She had so many books. I'd like to visit her and ask her why, after all these years and all the sorrow that came to Bimble, why she stayed. If I go, I'll go through Shepherd Town. This is the last one. The Beginning. More than once, I've slowed a dream and slowed its continuing nearly to stillness, my hand held in the air to notice I'm walking along the spine of a cold ridge in a Kentucky county. The wind is coming from all directions at once and sharply, but I know this is a necessary gloom. I'd taken a log track at first to climb and following up had passed a bank of snow the sun had failed to find. But the track gave out, and a more meandering, delicate path resumed. The track, created for one pursuit, had flattened and copied the path so far and made the way more logical. But logic has an end. It ends in the woods. It ends inside a dream. It ends in a tragic comedy when it meets the original world. 
I found an empty house one time in the woods above an old stream called Hanging Fork. The door was open and the glass in the windows looked wet from gleaming and blue-green jars still lined a shelf. A wardrobe held a dress and a, and a man's blue suit and the floor held level and looked recently swept. People had lived there once, but left, and left a long time before. The order of their lives was plain, but the ending of that order gave the chill that it must have come swiftly. And that which I felt from a dark faith and feeling was plainer still, as plain as the pencil stub I found jammed between the sashes of a window to cease its rattle in the wind. The thought of living there ran out. Even the purpose and the hope in a sudden moment flashed away. And where did they go? The thought, the hope, the modest purpose. Awake, I can't get hold of an answer. But I remember the splay of flowers around the house, how clearly they had spread beyond the left and the right of symmetry, how they were following the land back to its first inscrutable shape and form there in the mind of God or in the moment after God decided he would make a world apparently from loneliness. Thank you.